Consider the graph of a sequence, something like this one, the graph of 3 divided by square root n. Now, this is a sequence, and it only has outputs at the natural numbers, numbers like 1, 2, and 3. But there is a corresponding function of a real variable. It's the function 3 divided by square root, not of n, but of x. And it looks like this. It's the entire thing filled in. So the graph of a function, the graph of a sequence are in many ways the same, but for a sequence, you just restrict the domain to only allow the natural numbers as inputs. Indeed, when we were talking about calculus of functions of real variables, we would look at a point on a curve and we would give it coordinates, something like 2f of 2. And that would tell me the x and the y coordinates for a particular point on my graph. But if I'm talking about it through a sequence, instead of 2f of 2, it's 2 a2. The second term of the sequence gives me the height of a particular point, and the x-coordinate is given just by the 1, the 2, the 3, the value of n in general. Now, what I'm going to do is overlay on this graph a bunch of rectangles. And the idea for these rectangles is that the width of them is all just going to be the values 1. Uh, they're going from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and so on. But the height of these are given by the left endpoints of the curve, as in they're given by the sequence values. So for the leftmost rectangle, its height is going to be just a1. For the second one, its height is going to be the left endpoint on the second interval, the region 2 to 3. It's going to have a height of a2. And then it's going to be a3, a4, and so on down the line. So then the area of the first rectangle is 1 times a1. The area of the second rectangle is 1 times a2. And generally, if I want to talk about the area of all of the rectangles, this is going to be a summation, a sum from 1 to infinity of these heights a1 times these widths 1. Multiplying by 1 doesn't do anything, so I can get rid of that. So what I have is a geometric way of thinking about what a series is. The summation from 1 to infinity of a n can be thought of as the sum of these particular rectangles. And because I have this function of the continuous real variable x, the yellow curve underlying it, I can relate the sum of these rectangles to the area under that curve. Indeed, if I get rid of all of this, the area under the curve is just shaded in here in yellow. It's, in fact, an integral. It's the integral from 1 up to infinity of f of x dx. So there's actually two different geometric things going on here. The improper integral, the integral from 1 up to infinity of f of x dx, and this infinite series which represents the sum of all these rectangles. Now, in this specific example, my function is continuous, my function is decreasing, and my function is positive. And in that scenario, there's a relationship between these two things. Notice how the rectangles are always bigger than the portion that comes from the area of the curve. There's, there's little bits more sticking out in the area of the rectangles and the curve. So in this example, what we have is a relationship. We say that the improper integral is strictly less than the area of all the rectangles, strictly less than the series. Now, both of these things I'm comparing, the improper integral and the infinite series, both of them trundle off to infinity. They take either x going to infinity or n going to infinity. So the questions that we want to answer are, does this thing converge? Does it diverge? Do they both converge? Do they both diverge? Does one converge and the other? That's the kind of question we want to do when we're comparing these improper integrals to these infinite series. And in this case, when there's this inequality between them, where you say that the improper integral is strictly less than the series, you get the following fact. Imagine the improper integral diverged, the smaller one, so the area under the curve. Imagine that diversion went to infinity. Then the series, which geometrically is something that is bigger than that, must diverge as well. So in other words, I can say that if indeed the improper integral diverges, the series does as well. And this was true in that case where your function is positive, it is continuous, and it is decreasing. In fact, these assumptions are quite important. For example, if it was not going to be decreasing, like sometimes it went down and sometimes it went up, you wouldn't have that inequality that applied everywhere where always the rectangles were bigger than the corresponding version of the improper integral. Now, I've only really just done half of it. For example, let me do the other side, the other inequality. In the next example, I'm going to replace the left endpoints, which is what I have right now. All these rectangles represent left endpoints on each of the intervals. And instead, I'm going to use right endpoints. So it looks instead like this. Uh, that is, all of my rectangles are smaller. Their widths are all the same. Their widths are all just going to be 1. 
But now if I think about the leftmost, the first rectangle here, its height is not a 1, it's a 2 because I'm using the right endpoint. So this, the first one has this height of a 2. The second one has a height of a 3. The third one has a height of a 4, and so on. So I can make an inequality again, but it's a different one. That is to say, if I want to talk about the areas of the rectangles, I'm no longer starting at a 1. I'm starting at a 2. A 2 represents the first rectangle I look at. it. So it's not quite the same series before, not the sum from 1 to infinity, the sum from 2 to infinity. And you might think that's a big difference, but it really isn't. If I ask a question like, does a series converge? What happens for the first term doesn't matter. Whether it converges is a question of, as you go off towards infinity and you add more and more and more things, does that add up to a finite number or does it diverge? But if I just change the value of the first one, or heck, the first finite number of terms, it doesn't make a change to the question of convergence or divergence. So doing n equal to 1, n equal to 2, same difference. But it matters here from the perspective that I am going to contrast this with indeed the improper integral from 1 up to infinity. And for the improper integral from 1 up to infinity of f of x, that's the integral under the curve. Now my inequality is the other way around, which is to say that the improper integral is going to be the bigger one. It is bigger than this series from 2 all the way up to infinity. And so now when I do my analysis, it goes the other way around. Imagine the improper integral not diverges, imagine it converges. So the improper integral is converging. Well, in that scenario, that tells me that it is bigger than the series. So if the bigger thing converges, the smaller thing, the series must converge as well. So I get the other side of my theorem. It says that if the improper integral converges, then so too indeed does the series. And again, this is under the context of a function which is positive and decreasing and continuous where the function values when you plug in the end just give your series terms. Those are my assumptions. So I really have two parts. This one that we've just seen here, but also the one that we saw previously about divergence. And together, these two different sides are going to form the integral test. And they say, if you look at the improper integral and the improper integral converges or diverges, whatever it does, the same is true of the series. Okay, let's see this in a specific example. If we start with the integral of 3 over square root x, that function is what we began with. Now, this is actually just a p integral. If I change the square root, I could answer the whole class of problems, like not just to the power of 1 half, but to the power of p generally. So I may as well try to answer this whole class of problems. We've seen this integral before. This is an integral we know. And so the point here is that that so-called p-test for improper integrals, we now get another p-test for the corresponding series. That is, if I go and look at the series, the sum of, again, the 3 doesn't matter, but 3 over x to the power of p, well, this converges or diverge is exactly when the corresponding improper integral does. So it also diverges for p less than 1 and also converges for p greater than 1. So that is a great example of how we can use things we know, strengths from integration, to solve questions about series. And when that works, it's really great. Although I will caution you that it is not always the case that you know how to do the integrals. And it's not always the case that if you have a series, there's a nice function you understand that corresponds to it. But when you can represent a series by a function and when you can go and integrate that function, then this so-called integral test is incredibly powerful for determining convergence or divergence of a series.